All right, everybody. Well, welcome to this first meeting of the Michigan Farm to Institution Network, one of our virtual network meetings. This is the first of 2023, and we're going to focus today on the Michigan Good Food Charters focus on farm to school and farm to institution. So given that we're at the start of a year, at the start of a new charter and a new framework for the Farm to Institution Network as well, we wanted a chance to kind of um, set the stage for what will be coming this year and in future years and give you all a chance to get familiar with the directions both the charter and our network are headed and also gather feedback and questions from you and ideas about what you'd like that direction to look like. So we're glad to have a couple of um, guest speakers here today. So first off, I will go through our agenda um, and then we'll be doing some introductions and connecting um, so you all can know who's here as well. And I want to give you some MIFIN updates um, just quickly at the start of the meeting. We do have an open call for nominations for our Michigan Farm to Institution Network Advisory Committee. Uh, so I wanted to share a bit about that and be sure that you all know about it and can um, spread the word. And we'll take a few minutes to look at our framework for the Michigan Farm to Institution for 2022 and beyond, which we just finalized at the end of last year. And that framework um, both informed and was informed by the Michigan Good Food Charter. So there are definitely elements of Farm to Institution and our work through the Farm to Institution Network built into the charter. So our guest speakers will share more about what the charter looks like, what those farm to school and farm to institution elements are, and then they'll lead discussion and gather feedback from you all. And then we'll close by sharing some um, 2023 dates and events for our MIFIN calendar. It's quite busy in these first few months, so wanted to be sure that you were aware of all of the stuff we've got going on and you can join um, where it makes sense. And we will end promptly by 4.30. So um, if you all wouldn't mind, as way of introducing ourselves to each other, could you add into the chat your name and your affiliation and your role, please? We'd love to see who's here. And I didn't introduce myself. I'm Colleen Matz. I'm the Director of Farm to Institution Programs at the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems. And I'm the coordinator of the Michigan Farm to Institution Network. And another member of our Michigan Farm to Institution Network team who's joining us today, who is newer to the team too, um, is Kelly McClelland. And she's a community food systems educator with MSU Extension based in Flint and she will be taking notes for us today. So thanks to Kelly and we're glad to have you. All right, so looking through the chat, we have folks joining from Detroit. Welcome, Macomb. I see Constantine. We've got Food Corps represented, MSU Extension represented. Thanks for joining. Northwest Michigan, Northeast Lower Michigan. All right, good geographic distribution. And we'll ask people as they join in if they can add their names and affiliations and roles there as well. Welcome. Amanda from Groundwork and Beth from KBCC. So next off, we wanted to take a second just to learn a little bit more about you all and have a chance to learn about each other. Um, so my question for today, given that we are at the start of a new year, and I'm not all about resolutions and intentions for the year, I don't know how you are, but maybe we can talk about what is just one thing that you have always wanted to learn? Whether that's your resolution for this year, something you wanna learn or do, um, or if it's just more of a lifelong aspiration, feel free to add that in the chat.
Welcome those who are joining new. We are responding now to the question of what is one thing you have always wanted to learn? If you can add your answer to the chat. And if you're um, just joining, please also add your name, affiliation, and your role to the chat as well. I've always wanted to take singing lessons. We see here um, there's an interest in pottery, glass blowing, ooh, learning Italian, how to avalanche safely, sign language and woodworking, hiking and wilderness survival skills, processing wild game, all right, survival skills and bushcraft, personal fiscal responsibility, ASL, Spanish, string instruments, and singing at the same time. <laughs> Thanks, Mario. <laughs> All right, so a good diversity of interests here and things that we want to learn. So maybe we'll check back on those at a later date to see if we're moving forward with any of those things this year. Thank you for taking a moment to indulge me on that. So um, to get us going with some updates about the Michigan Farm to Institution Network for this year, uh, as I mentioned, there's an open call for nominations for our Michigan Farm to Institution Network Advisory Committee. So ever since the Farm to Institution Network launched in 2014, we have been guided by a advisory committee of farm to institution practitioners out in the field who are doing this work in action, who can guide us and keep us on track to make sure that we're meeting real needs of you know the folks who are out there in the field making this work happen. So they've been really important for um, guiding us, providing feedback on our work as we go. Um, so we are looking to kind of round out that advisory committee group. We have members returning. Some of them are returning from the very beginning. Some have joined more recently, uh, but we have some open seats. So we wanted to make a formal public call for um, new advisory committee members for the 2023 year. So we do have a nomination call on our website. You can find it at the, the URL is there, whoops, um, at myfarmedinstitution.org for the nomination form and the process. Um, you can learn more about it there. But in short, you are welcome to nominate yourself or someone else. And we're asking for nominations to come in by Friday, end of day on February 3rd one day after Groundhog Day, if anyone else observed that day as a holiday, as my family does. And um, the role for the Farm and Institution Network is a one-year calendar commitment with the possibility to extend into future years. And the requirement is really just to attend four quarterly two-hour meetings. Those have been virtual um, in the recent years, of course, but we are hoping to get together in person at least once this year. And generally, we're asking these folks to support the Farms Institution Network and cultivate Michigan activities and to serve as a champion and an ambassador. So we see the, um, the benefits to advisory committee members and have heard from current advisory committee members that this role has really helped them um, build their own networks around this work and to learn and connect with people that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, but we are looking for these folks to help guide our farm to institution work across the state and strengthen local and regional supply chain and the culture of food procurement in the state. Thanks for adding that nomination form, Lindsay. So in particular, we're looking for one person each to fill the following open seats, and we'll certainly take nominations more broadly, but um, we're trying to make sure that all perspectives of that farm to institution supply chain are represented. So there's the institutional food program side, we're looking for senior facilities, a student representative from a college or university, any type of college or university, um, contracted food service management from higher education and hospitals and healthcare. And then on the local and regional supply chain side, we're seeking farm businesses, and that can be from different scales and types and with experience or interest in institutional sales, experience is not required. 
We are looking for a food processor, hopefully one that does minimal processing of Michigan grown or raised foods that are appropriate for institutional food service operations. And we're seeking a representative from a produce distributor in Michigan that um, sources from Michigan farms and sells to Michigan institutions. So I wanted to be sure to mention this um, so that y'all can help us make sure that we get nominations to help fill these seats this year as much as possible. And it's fine if we continue on with some open seats, but we wanted to make the effort to get the word out there and see who might show up that we might not know of yet who would be interested in this role. And just to give you a sense, here are some of our advisory committee members that are returning from this year, just the ones that are confirmed to date. Um, we have a few more that are in flux here, so I'm not adding their names here just yet because they're not quite confirmed, but we have a nice diversity of perspectives and a good diversity in terms of geographic representation, and we want to just keep expanding that to make sure that we are um, going in the right direction with our work and have that guidance from a, a team of advisory committee members. Okay, so with that um, out of the way, I wanted to take a minute to look at our Michigan Farm to Institution framework. This is our new framework for 2022 and beyond, as I mentioned, and this was a product of a multi-year process to gather feedback from our members like you, from our advisory committee and our trustee management team, which is made up of folks from the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems and MSU Extension Community Food Systems to develop a plan for where we wanna go with our work in the years ahead. So in 2014, we were launched with the 2010 Michigan Good, Good Food Charter goal in mind that institutions source 20% of their food products from Michigan by 2020. Um, so in 2019, we started on a process to look at what's next for our network beyond that 2020 goal. So we began gathering feedback in person um, at a network gathering in November of 2019, which luckily we got in under the wire before the pandemic began. So glad that we did that. And um, virtually, we had many opportunities for gathering feedback, refining the ideas, and pulling this together into what is now a publicly available document. So it looks a little something like this, but I'm going to put the link in our chat here so you all can take a look at it too. There it is. Um, so I wanted to give us just two minutes to take a look at that so that you can become more familiar with it. We did share about this framework last year around this time um, because we were just finalizing the language around it. This is now the final finished product that is public. Um, so as we go into more of a conversation around the bigger picture charter work, I wanted you all to have this in mind. So it is 3.15 right now. If we can quietly take two minutes to familiarize yourself with this framework, that will be good footing for us to have the next conversation on the charter. So I'm going to shut up for a minute while you can take a look at this. You can find the link in the chat.
All right. So now that you all had a quiet couple of minutes to take a look at our framework, I want to now turn it over to our friends from the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems who are going to guide us through the next conversation around the Michigan Good Food Charter. Lindsay Scalera is the Community Food Systems Collaboration Specialist and has been really coordinating all of the Michigan Good Food Charter work over the past few years. Um, but for those who weren't aware, Lindsay also was a co-coordinator with me on the Farmed Institution Network in her former role at the Ecology Center before she joined us at MSU. So glad she's here and she is um, intimately familiar with all of the inner workings of the Michigan <laughs> Farmed Institution Network. So she'll bring good perspective to this conversation today. And Jordan Lindsay is our grassroots organizing fellow, a newer member of the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems, and I'm excited for them to lead the conversation from here. So I'm going to stop my share and I'll turn it over to you both. All right. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, I think I'm going to share my screen first. Is that right, Jordan? <laughs> I think I'm going to go over some grounding for ah. goals for today before you go into the presentation. Okay. Okay, awesome. So for some grounding, today's discussion is really an opportunity to shape the work of MIFIN and the Charter Council moving forward, especially at the intersection of both of those bodies. Um, so we want to take a practical look at the MIFIN framework and how it aligns with the updated Michigan Good Food Charter. So for today's conversation, we're going to do a little presentation and create some space for discussion where we can both share a broad picture of what the charter is and where MIFIN's framework shows up in it. Um, and talk more about what it looks like in practice. And we also want to use the charter strategies to discuss how we can all collaborate to advance Miffin's framework. So with that, I will pass it over to Lindsay. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at a sl some slides. Okay, sorry, let me get them going. Where did they go? <laughs> Let me try this again. Ah, there they are. Okay. Yes. All right. So in this little presentation, we are going to uh, do a little bit of an overview of the charter and, and what it is. Um, then we're going to take a closer look at the um, the specific uh, strategies and topics that we have in there and how they align. And then we have a little bit of time for questions, but then we'll go into discussion. Well, a large group discussion. Okay. Let's get into it. So. As Colleen mentioned, um, you know, we had the original charter, which was published in 2010, had that original goal. Overall, the charter, um, the original charter helped kind of build momentum around efforts um, across Michigan to advance a food system that promotes equity, health, sustainability, and thriving economies. And um, none of that's really changed. Um, those are still, by and large, our big things. Um, so we've uh, been asking folks, you know, what role is the charter playing or what role could it play? And they've talked about kind of this, this document can help guide funding decisions. It can help organizations and businesses think about how to create a more equitable food system. Um, we use it as a tool for economic development and especially connecting policy programs and people. Um, and we also know that we kind of need all hands on deck to make this stuff happen. So, um, you know, we need our, you know, networks like this where people can connect and commiserate <laughs> uh, so, you know, you're not alone, um, share resources, we need our funding and investment partners, we need policymakers and government agencies and those local and regional community-based organizations and businesses. Everybody has a role to play. And one of the things I love about Farm to Institution and within especially is that you are all here, like you're all here already, <laughs> you're doing it. So it's great to have um, such a robust network to talk about all of this with. So we, uh, I wanted to share how the charter is organized. So this might help you navigate it a little bit. So we've got a vision. We've got six goals um, to sort of flow along with those six goals. We've got six strategies, which each have um, a number of actions that go along with them. Um, in the original charter, we had um, 22 agenda priorities that were organized a little differently. Um, and we have those six goals. Um, as you'll see, our goals, um, we've written them as result statements and we want them, we understand that they are super interconnected. Uh, so that's where the strategies and actions come in to sort of turn it into something a little bit more practical. Um, another thing to note 
uh, is that while we're going about doing this work, it's super important that we're looking at like root causes and ongoing impacts of um, racism and other systemic inequities. Uh, so that's kind of woven throughout the charter as well to help us look at in a practical way how we can do that. Um, and oh, the other thing I like to tell people is that with these actions that we've identified through this like also a three year process with lots of, even during the pandemic, lots of um, opportunity for, uh, for contribution from, from folks around the state um, to refine this. And uh, what that taught us is that a lot of this work is already happening in different places. And there, and there are some, some of the ideas are also, um, you know, things that we haven't achieved yet. So opportunities for action. So here's our vision. Uh, Michigan has a thriving food economy distinguished by equity, health and sustainability. And another way of talking about that is that, um, and this kind of gets at some of our definitions and values that are in, in the charter. So we're, we're supporting, we need systemic change um, to um, create food systems that support, or food systems that you know, ensure food is accessible to everyone, promoting healthy communities using fair and sustainable production methods and supporting a diverse and equitable society. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these, but these are our goals. And as I said earlier, they're super interconnected. Um, so there's a lot going on here. And another thing I like about Farm to Institution is that um, at the very least, you're doing two of these things. <laughs> at the most, uh, you could be doing all of these things. So I would say um, at its heart, you know, a Farm to Institution is very much about farm and food business viability and food access. Um, maybe that's interlinked with health. Um, but uh, depending on what you're up to and, and the kind of farmers and food producers you support, you might be you know, helping with um, fair wages and economic opportunities, sustainable ecosystems, making our communities more resilient to climate change, things like that. So Farm to Institution has a lot of opportunities to um, help advance these goals. It's very exciting. Um, I think the next one, oh, before I get into this, um, so next we'll take a look at each of those, um, those topic areas with the six strategies. And we've kind of overlaid um, the MIFFIN framework on top of those just to see like, where does it show up? But we definitely want for our discussion, we want you to be thinking of your own examples or things that you've seen um, uh, out in the world or in your own work um, that, that relate to this. So hopefully this will spark some ideas for you. Um, there is a chat. I just want to double check if there's a question. Oh, okay. Nope, thanks. Oop. Okay, so in the farm and food business development, Space. We our strategy is cultivate thriving local and regional farm, local regional farm and food businesses. Um, and here we've recommended actions are kind of like our bigger recommendations, um, establishing some kind of statewide farm and food business viability program or network. And I think there's like lots of different pieces of that already in the works. Um, and Miffin is certainly at the table, I would say. Um, uh, also generating e equitable access to capital and maximizing investment opportunities for farm and food businesses um, and bipoc led food system initiatives. Um, and so the MIFFIN framework example, I put a couple of things in here. So um, for institutions that are um, uh, doing farm institution, maybe you're, you're also supporting farm viability and the next generation of farmers. Um, institutions adopting supplier diversity programs are helping advance some of this because that's a very intentional investment. Um, and then also where we're connecting with, um, maybe through that, that farm viability program or the different kinds of food business development things, uh, connecting with the development of BIPOC and women owned and operated farm and food businesses throughout the value chain. So there's some ways that that could take place. Um, in the local regional food and value chains <laughs> section, We've got our strategy is prioritize local and regional food systems within a global economy. So we already put a lot of um, effort and money as a society into that global economy. And so let's look at what we can do if we've also prioritized local and regional there. And so this is where we have the, we've included um, under, I can't remember which one it's under. I think it's number three. <laughs> supporting, I might be wrong, support Michigan institutions to purchase 25% uh, of food products from Michigan growers. So this came from you all, we cite it back to you. Um, once you were ready, it was kind of good timing for us all to be working on these things together. Um, but you also have things like promoting farms and food hubs as sources for local food and increasing the transparency and communication. So we um, have some of those, some recommendations and ideas around all of those things. 
uh, in here. Probably better not to read all the actions out loud just for time. Um, but you can absolutely follow that link that Jordan sent to dive into it more. Okay, so uh, under our collaboration infrastructure, which is kind of our uh, name for the fact that and the way that we all work together. Um, so kind of elevating that as, as important. Um, and our strategy here is to use the power of collaboration to dismantle racism and systemic inequity in food systems. And so our actions kind of run the gamut here. Um, on a bunch of different things, but within the Miffin framework, um, you all have this wonderful um, set of values. And so for folks who are kind of in their practice, we're going to incorporate those values into their farmed institution work. I think that's one way that some of these things can be achieved, especially giving the example here of like those relationships between farmers and, and food service uh, folks. Um, but also that piece about cultivating the next generation of food system leaders through the work that you do. So you can look at the advisory committee, you can look at the folks who are here on this meeting and see some lines of folks having um, uh, had some career pathways in this and becoming leaders and or being a leader outright in, in your space. So I think that's something important that Mithin members are doing as well. Um, I'm going to go through the next couple and then I'll check the chat, but if there's something super important, Jordan, will you ping me? Lindsay, I was just giving you a time check. We have okay. one minute left planned right. for this, but if you need more time, go Okay, I'll it. talk less, you guys. <laughs> okay, I'll talk, I'll try not to talk too fast. <laughs> Employment equity, establishing fair compensation and safe work environments and opportunity career, opportunities for career advancement in food systems. This one's a little self-explanatory as far as where MIFIN um, fits and where the, the work that you all are doing fits. So um, like I was just mentioning, those career pathways um, and uh, workforce development through throughout food value chains. So certainly um, farm to institution sometimes creates jobs, it creates different leadership positions. I think uh, all of this is super important. We're just illustrating. I think there's so many cool things that you do. <laughs> okay. For land and ecosystem stewardship, um, our strategy is uh, foster climate resilience through equitable land stewardship. And there's a lot in this section, but um, a couple of the things that stand out from the Mifflin framework is that, um, you know, as institutions, you're looking at offering more food that's environmentally sustainable and also promoting those value chains um, that prioritize environmentally sustainable food production practices. Um, and another piece to this that we have in here that was highly informed by your framework um, is, you know, the minimizing um, food packaging and prioritizing using sustainable materials. So we have a piece even about like, you know, minimizing single use plastic where we can and prioritizing re reusable recyclables. Um, so that's something I know a lot of folks are working on as well. Last one, nutrition, health and food. This one also feels a little self-explanatory, but our, our strategy is support people to have real choices that lead to good food and health. Um, and so a couple of things I've noted here was um, Mithin uh, members, um, you know, institutions and the folks that are supporting them um, and food providers are looking to provide equitable access, you know, and quality foods for, for first foods, if we're, looking, if we're including, um, you know, farm to ECE, as well as young eaters. Um, that's a piece that we have in here. Um, I think it goes beyond just the young, young people. Um, and integrating culturally relevant food ways and nutrition education into all the, the food service practices. So we know there's folks working on that as well. I'm gonna leave it there. Hopefully this kind of gives you um, a sense of practically like what could we be doing or, or inspires you. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. Do we wanna, is, or maybe if there's one or two burning questions. Otherwise, I think I, oops, I think I will turn it back over to Jordan. And if you have questions, like we can take them in the chat or we can always check in with you later. Jordan, what do you think? <laughs> Sorry, I was responding to a direct message. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to open it up for a discussion. I think we can include any questions, reactions about the presentation in this section. We did have some guiding questions that we wanted to go over with folks. Um, so these are the questions that we were thinking about, and they're kind of segmented into three different parts. So the first part, thinking about leaders and champions, really 
like curious to hear more about who are the leaders and champions already doing this work or getting started with this work and who are the leaders and champions for this work so that we can learn and share resources together. Um, also want to use this opportunity to maybe identify some gaps that need to be filled, whether that's policy, practices, knowledge, relationship building, um, hearing more about your policy priorities so that we can include them in the Charter Council policy prioritization process. Um, also questions around networking and learning opportunities. So what is it that we need to learn more about to advance um, farm to institution work? And what are the topics we can create learning and networking around to support that? So I know this is a lot to think about, but I wanna, can we leave that slide up actually or put oh, it yeah. in the chat gonna, maybe? Yeah, I can put it in the chat. I was gonna move to okay. the Oh, there. perfect, thank you. Yeah, and I'll put this in the chat as well. So I think maybe the way we could do this is just kind of free flow and just follow the energy of the group. And we don't necessarily have to tackle these in a particular order so that whatever feels most relevant for folks to, to bring up and ask about is probably the most important thing to say. Does that feel good to folks? Will you give me like a thumbs? Okay, I see one thumbs. You can also put your thumbs down or put something in the chat. Okay, cool. Emergent strategy. I love it. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have thoughts they want to kick it off with or questions? Initial reactions to Lindsay's presentation or these questions that we're posing. And I'm putting the questions in the chat as well. Just give me one second here. It's kind of long. <laughs> and also, if you're feeling confused or itchy, as Lindsay likes to say, about anything that was brought up. We can also start there if you're like, I don't want to talk about any of these questions. I want to talk about this thing over here. Just like, let us know. <laughs> Absolutely. Is it, uh, let's start, oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. So I'm not, I, uh, I'm going to start at gaps if that's okay. A uh, couple Perfect. of things that have been in the back of my head um, for some time. Um, and, and I kind of look back at, uh, as you were going through this on the institutional side and, and getting those healthy foods and starting at a young age and that type of thing. And I think sometimes there is a, uh, a gap between the educational piece that goes on um, with individuals in the institutions and uh, just getting them those, the, the good food, the healthy food. So it's one thing to supply good food, but are we being really conscientious about doing the educational part ar around that? And I'm thinking on the school side of things. That's great. Thanks, Clarence. I'm also seeing some stuff in the chat. Le there's lots of leaders and champions in the Zoom room. Yes. So people want to also just shout out what they're championing. Um, that might help us take inventory as well. Thinking if anybody wants sort of like the overview of it, I want to say it's page like 16 or 17, I might be wrong, in the charter that has the, uh, the like, like an index of all those things. If you want to look at that while you're thinking for thinking about examples, and I can just pull it up real quick. Actually, this is clickable, so why don't we do this? The strategies index. Ah, oh, I was right, 16. Page 16. So there's, um, this is kind of what I breathed over real quick. You want to take a closer look yourself. I'm going to go back to the notebook. 
I'm not sure how to <laughs> raise my hand or, or input. Um, and I'm also not sure if this is the exact appropriate form for this, but um, in some conversations that we've had locally, um, it's, you know, we obviously want all this food to be available and education to go along with it. Um, but we've also had, you know, issues with some local farms, like closing down certain sections of um, their farms or, you know, minimizing what they provide. And I think um, that we need to figure out how to um, support those local farms at all kinds of levels, including, you know, policy and, um, you know, sustainability. I know that's part of, you know, the action steps, but, you know, really talking to these farmers and seeing what their barriers are. Um, and and I'm sure there uh, there's an endless list, um, but if we don't have local farms, we can't provide local food. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. I think that's really important to, to bring up. How are we in conversation with farmers? How are we organizing with farmers to close some of those gaps and barriers they're facing? I think I could uh, input that. On, oh, go ahead, uh, Clarence, if you were. Hey, I, I was just going to mention uh, to, to kind of go off that one of the things that local farms struggle with is how do we get that food uh process where can they go with it before they get to the institution or the institution is going to want that processed a certain way and i think that's a big obstacle it would be nice to know out who out there in that small minimal uh segment can do that yeah totally clarence that's actually kind of exactly what i was about to go on is you know what is our what's the best choices we have for supply chain kind of connection distributor wise in the state so that we're not going outside that we're not using um companies that are going to take more time and put more you know carbon footprint out there to get the job done i know there's some that work with mfin like you know cherry capital and things like that and uh i would like to you know get a better idea of you know as a community of who we're all using and what's the most efficient for this for the products Right. So we're all going to have different products. You know, if you've got basil versus, you know, parsley, you're going to need them at different temperatures. You're going to need little things like that, that I think as a community, a community, we could discuss a little bit further to see what kind of experiences we had as opposed to dealing with, uh, you know, reps or, you know, if, if that makes sense, you know, dealing more or less with the actual producers and seeing what the experience is as opposed to what the, outcome is. Um, with that said, uh, we would also like to, uh, as my company Planet Detroit, we would also like to be available to school districts and health districts around the entire mitten uh, and its brother upstairs to, you know, make sure that if people need info on how to do uh, in indoor growing, small scale or large scale that we can be of assistance because I kind of feel like that is something we're missing as a as a uh, you know as a state that is you know <laughs> in snow right now it, it's just it's hard to do so uh I just want to make sure that people know they can reach out to us as well um if they're looking for any kind of information uh or any kind of clarification or just guidance and uh, about what we can do and what, how we can help you. And if it's in um, you know, the institution network, I think it's something that we would be happy to do, uh, you know, just as it were. So I, I, would, I would like more, I guess, reaching out to, to, to us and more reaching out to you guys about what you think is the hurdles that you're gonna jump and let us know. And, so that we can also ask you <laughs> how to jump those hurdles as well. Thanks, y'all. A lot of really juicy, juicy topics coming up. After that, Colleen. <laughs> Thank you.
Who else has something that they're noticing or want to share or ask? I'd like to add into the conversation. This is Kelly Carpenter Crawford. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm thinking about what Clarence started with and the education side um, in schools, like the work that Food Corps is doing. And my one of the hats I'm wearing here today is like as a parent advocate for getting our district to make better choices. And so sort of policy related, um, program related, um, supporting like our school district, our ISDs to make better choices, like from the policy side. So just wearing that parent hat, like not only educating students about the good food options, but the parents to help drive the policy side of it, to make those demands and to organize. And one of the organizations I represent is the PTA at the local and state level. So getting PTA involved with um, making those policy asks. Awesome, thank you, Kelly. I'll just real quickly do a little add in and, and sometimes policies driven by money. <laughs> Um, and, and schools will implement some of those educational activities on a deeper level if there is funding or uh, some kind of evaluation or standard that is attached to that. Um, I'm curious if folks, if folks don't want to call out themselves as leaders and champions, if others, if you want to call out somebody else or acknowledge someone else as a leader doing something awesome, uh, you know, we're going to be looking for storytellers and, and folks to help us illustrate, you know, what is possible and, and connect around some of these things. So we'd love to hear more on that too. No need to be if fun. I may, for leaders and champions, I think the best thing to look for is the most local markets, like farmers markets that are going to run. You're going to find the best connections there. The people that really have a, are in touch with what it takes in their own um, society or their little community to actually get it done. So I think that's extremely important. That's where we find most of the people that want to help us learn how to do things better, I think. If I can, about the school budgets being complicated too. Um, had a really good experience uh, with the DPS, um, the Detroit Public Schools, with uh, Charles Drew, which is a school for 16 to 36 year old um, adults with disabilities. And they have, I think it's like eight or 16 acres that they grow on right now. And they provide, I think it's a third of all the food that goes into the DPS. So, you know, there's a lot of like, cut offness where people don't talk about one school district versus the other. So learning how to bridge that gap would be extremely beneficial, I think. Uh, if there's you know, no politics involved, just bridge the gap, talk about it. And I think when you're talking about champions, there are people that are doing that educational piece um, and, and really have some great practices. It's just figuring out who those are and how they're doing that and how they integrate that. Um, I, I'll just share one example. There's a, a kindergarten teacher or first grade teacher as a vermiculture project, but her uh, requirement for students to feed the worms or that they have to have a healthy food choice that the worms can eat too. And when it comes down to the snacks to be able to feed them. Um, and it's finding out those kind of incentives and edges that um, ideas that uh, kind of push the edge to to go oh that's pretty some something that's pretty simple to do 
Um, and it's finding out who those people are out there that have those good ideas and, and find a way to share those out with everyone. Really appreciating what everyone is sharing so far. And I'd love to invite some voices who haven't spoken up yet to, to let us know what's on their mind too. I can say something. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amanda. <laughs> I, fi I figure, um, you know, we've got the time, I might as well speak up. Um, so a few of you guys already know me through Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities. Um, I am there as the engage the policy and engagement specialist for the 10 cents a meal program. And that, you know, that's a program in and of itself that does a lot of work in understanding local food systems and how that feeds into schools and everything. And if you're familiar with the program, then you already know what I'm talking about. Um, in addition to that work, so I actually found my way to groundwork through some of the uh, grassroots work that I've been doing in the Detroit area um, on my own in a lot of what you guys are already talking about. So I didn't want this to be like a kind of toot my own horn kind of a moment, but I am doing a lot of this work and it would be interesting to continue to be involved in that in some way. So I own and operate and uh, the creative director for Finnegan's Farms. We're a sustainable agricultural design firm in the Detroit area. We do a lot of work with gardeners and farmers and folks who want to get into growing food, but don't know how to do that. And so we offer them a lot of supports and getting started in that way. My background is actually in the local food systems and agricultural defense as it relates to rebuilding food systems um, in a sustainable way after there's been some sort of man-made or natural disaster. So that is like what I studied <laughs> was this kind of a thing. And like, this is what I'm passionate about. But um, anyway, with all of that knowledge, what we do is we connect with businesses, organizations, different groups, designers out here who want to create sustainable um, green spaces here. Um, so whether that is a garden or a community garden, or it's something like a full blown farmer's market, or even something, um, if you're familiar with the Detroit um, food, people's food co-op, things like that, like bigger spaces where people can, can actually come together and, uh, purchase and sell uh, local food products. So I'm just kind of throwing myself out there. If you guys ever needed any consult work in that way, I do work with a lot of businesses here in the Detroit area and a lot of other community activists here in the Detroit area who are working to increase equity in these spaces, especially as it comes to including like BIPOC and other minority farmers. So um, that's a little bit about me. And then we did have a little bit of information put here in, excuse me, in the chat about the 10 cents a meal program as well. And uh, let's see. Yes, thank you, Colleen. <laughs> oh, and then, yes, I can go ahead and put some information about the, the farm there as well, uh, for sure, Lindsay. But yeah, if you guys have questions or something like that, I'm always happy to lend some expertise just because I, you know, I'm really passionate about this work. And if there's something I can lend in my years of experience doing it from both the policy side and the grassroots, I'm the literal farmer down the street um, at side of things, then I would definitely love to jump in. That is amazing, Amanda. Thank you for coming off mute to share about your work. Really appreciate hearing that. Who else has something on their mind? I'm not gonna name names, but I know some folks on the line are working behind the scenes, at least on um, the idea of universal school meals. 
So wondering if anyone would be interested in talking about that. I saw some more national um, information about that today through the National Farm to School Network that shows that that movement is growing and Michigan is not on the map yet. So that's on, the, on in my mind as we're talking about policy too. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I feel like Dale's playing. <laughs> She's waiting for me. So um, yeah, there are some organizations, including Food Corps and Groundworks, um, and um, who have been interested in exploring um, school meals for all in Michigan. Um, so we've been having some um, conversations along with No Kid Hungry. Um, and then there's also some other work that's happening um, with the American Heart Association. Um, so there's sort of like a lot of background information that's kind of happening right now. I'm just like researching, like, what could this look like? Um, and um, sort of what are the pathways to trying to achieve this? Um, it's no kid hungry, um, but that's okay. Um, I, I know they're all kind of like related, but um, which that's part of share our strength. Um, so um yeah, so there's no like active bill that's um, that's trying to get passed right in this moment. But I think, um, as Colleen just said, there's a lot that's happening throughout the country with individual states because the federal government has clearly said this isn't it's not happening right now. Um, so states are doing it individually, um, and I think. Um, as we all know, with the change in our legislators um, there's. Uh, just a lot of excitement around this issue. So um, that's something that will be emerging. <laughs> that's about all I got. <laughs> Thanks, Seema. I see Megan's adding a link to the newest report that shares findings from evaluation on 10 cents a meal. So related info on local foods and schools and early child care. Thank you, Megan. We only have, we have a few more minutes left in this session, in this section of the agenda. Um, I'm wondering, especially about this last question, if there are other things that folks want more information about and maybe not only, but especially if it relates to the charter or how to use the charter in your work. Sorry to be a mic hog, but I, uh, we're working with <laughs> um, New Lab to do autonomous delivery and pickup from local, um, you know, urban farms in Detroit. And so any questions that you think, or any of you think would be beneficial for us to address in that would be greatly appreciated um, so that we can make sure more voices are being heard by the people that are running it. Thank you. And is it planted Detroit or planted Detroit? It is planted with a T. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I got an email from Planet Detroit earlier today. So that was on my <laughs> That might have been me, Lindsay. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't realize I got it confused. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. I know who you are. <laughs> I see Colleen sharing some resources in the chat. Thank you, Colleen. Any other questions about the charter, answers to these questions, thoughts? I don't know if I have a formulated question. But one thing that I've observed, <laughs> um, and so Food Court, we're working with school districts and nonprofit partners that are working with schools. And so just like anecdotally with conversations that I've had, 
I know that like some of the rural school districts that we that I talk to when I'm having conversations about like local procurement and things like that. Um, there's yeah, like I, I don't know if there's more opportunity or different opportunities to try to connect rural schools to provide resources for each other. Um, or like districts that have more autonomy with what they're purchasing if they don't have a food service like management company that they're using. Um, but I try to provide the resources I can when I'm talking with like individual school districts, but I just wonder if there are, um, like I know 10 cents a meal, like this has come up a bunch of times of like 10 cents a meal has been hard for some of our, the rural school districts that I talk to, to actually utilize. They like the idea, but then they don't have the staff capacity for it, for instance. And I know that this year, 10 cents a meal, the process I believe is changing a little bit to make it a little less um, burdensome, but that's just like something that has come up in my conversations. And I don't know if that's like anecdotal or if others have found the same thing in your conversations. I can add, um, this is Colleen, that we are hearing across the board um, with schools, but other types of institutions too that labor um, continues to be one of the biggest challenges that then exacerbates other issues, right? So um, the ability to even use some of the funding that's coming down, including from the federal government, um, in addition to 10 cents, which is a Michigan funding source, um, is difficult. So I would love to hear if anyone has any bright ideas to kind of maybe provide some intermediary solutions to that. Not necessarily, um, it sounds like money is available. Um, some of it could go potentially to labor or budgets could um, be reworked to go to labor. But how do we address short-term labor challenges in the hopes of um, building some of these longer term systems changes out. And I don't have an answer to that, but that's something that um, I was in a group discussing yesterday, um, that very issue of all of this money that's coming. Um, and we might be bringing more to the state, depending on some other proposals that are going in that could really make some great change. But um, labor continues to be an issue that. Um, might limit some of those funds and innovations from moving forward. So that's a sticking point, I think, for a lot of folks right now. Yeah, thanks for naming that, Colleen. Um, before I transition us, oh, I see Kelly's got a hand. Yeah, Kelly. Just a thought I think that intersects with that. Um, it, it just thinking about how that the labor shortage and the lack of resources to be able to carry out with fidelity the 10 cents a meal or districts like my own that don't even apply. Um, just wondering about strategies to grow that work beyond like having it live in nutrition services so that it rests with our boards of education. And again, this is me like with my PTA hat, but like communities demanding, you know, making those asks, having those expectations around our community is supporting local food, you know, better food choices. So having, and I think it would be a win-win. It would then maybe help grow, you know, those budget decisions to better support the nutrition services staff and the people that are carrying out the work. If that was more outside of just those kind of experts. Thanks, Kelly. Before I transition us, does anyone else have any burning thoughts or questions they want to share? Can I can I say something? This is more. Yeah. yeah. You know, when we're talking about the uh, labor and one of the issues, the short labor we have also due to the wages we pay our staff. Uh, and and this is uh, it's going to be a huge uh, and it is cool if we can continue 
with uh, providing the best nutrition uh, with minimal process to it. And as you know, probably in 2024, the USDA is going to come with a new guidelines, probably a more strict guidelines. Uh, God knows, God knows what they will bring. Uh, so uh, I think that's that's uh, something. When I look at the uh, grant we get through the state, uh, it is a lot about equipment, a lot about the ten cents, but we never had. Uh, something where we could be used to the labor issue. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky in my district that I never go in the red, and I am proposing adding at least a three dollars to five dollars an hour increase to my staff. Uh, uh, because if you want to be competing with the best of the best, uh, and uh, a, a, a school, not a school, but uh, uh, a fast or uh, order restaurant uh, paying a 20 22 dollars an hour uh, it is no longer it is the mom and dad who just want to uh, have a job uh, to, to help them out because their kids go, attend the schools I I uh, changed the supervisors were wages I, I just hired uh, somebody making sixty thousand dollar a year as a lead supervisor and and then regular supervisor, I'm moving up, moving them up from 34, 35 to about 50,000 for me to keep them. And if you want to compete with the outside, you know, the state has to look and the USDA has to look somehow for the the hardest way, the hardest working people in schools and the least they get, you know, as an administrator. Administrator, I, I I I negotiated my wages. I they pay me very well, but and if it is up to me as a director, I'm gonna pay my staff. You know the way I get paid, the percentage wise. So I think we need to look at it also from the bottom up and from the up to down to make sure there is equity because we talk about equity and sometimes we compete and also. When you have another department in support the staff who are making more money than the child nutrition services staff, then it is we hire, we train, and then we sit, then then they move to another department because that's you know I could sit in the office next to the broom and uh, uh, and 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 uh, uh, and getting made getting paid a lot more and and then complain and pitch up. A, a lot about why you have any grapes in the cafeteria because I might have been down. So <laughs> the idea is, is we really need to elevate the level of child nutrition, even not only in the eye of people, but also money talks. I think the state and the USDA has to recognize, recognize that if you want to compete and you want to bring the uh, quality uh, uh, food, then uh, it's no longer, it is, you work 15 years, now you are a supervisor. I'm going to put it to the outside, then you can uh, compete with, the, with somebody from the outside who might be a chef or she might be a nutritionist or whatever the case is. But if you don't pay them, you're not going to get what you're looking for, except the people who has a lot of passion for the kids and money is not an issue. I just want to make a note. That's great. Thanks for adding your voice to the conversation, Mo. Good job, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Dave. And then we're, I think, if you have like something burning, will you just raise your hand? Because I do want to get to Lindsay's closing activity, but I also want to hear <laughs> folks' voices. So yeah, go for it, Dave. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd love to talk, um, you know, about labor constraints as well. And I think universities and schools will need to do more with less. And I think collaboration and coordination on the farm level and the institution level is really important gap to address. So I'm, I'm finding it's difficult for institutions to commit their purchasing to local farms because if there's a disruption, they still need to feed 10,000 students and therefore they rely on the conventional food system and keep farmers and small farmers as a nice to have option. So I think a key piece to local sourcing is giving institutions confidence that local supply is resilient and consistent. 
and that there, there are supply redundancies built in and aggregation across many different producers and kind of take that coordination burden out of the hands of both the farm and the institution. And I think coordination could be supply and demand planning, logistics, first mile, last mile, back hauling, processing, cut and freeze, invoicing, and just simplifying um, the many independent relationships that make up a complete supply chain for these schools. I am going to specifically come back and rewatch the uh, recording of this so I can make sure I catch all those things. That was all super good. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else have something they want to say before we transition? Okay. If folks do want to reach out afterwards, I put my email in the chat and I'm happy to talk more about this stuff and make sure it gets elevated in the right places within the Charter Council too. Because um, the Charter Council is really the implementing body, co coordinating the implementation. Everyone, there's so many people that are actually implementing the Charter, but they're coordinating the implementation of it and making sure especially policies get um, elevated that need to and get the support that they need to. So. With that, I will pass it over to Lindsay for our closing activity. I'm cheering because Dave wrote it down. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna co I'm gonna copy that in right now. Okay. So, okay. Let me do that. And we're gonna get into. All right. Just don't look at it. It's kind of ugly. I'll fix it later. <laughs> Let me stop my share. Um. Actually, I think we were gonna go back to the slides real quick just to give it to you. I'm gonna I'll copy this into the chat as well. Our final activity. Um, share the slides again. So, just looking at some reflections. Um, yeah. Oh, you got it, Jordan. Thank you. Forgot to put that in there. So, we just want to hear from folks. You know, uh, we figured rosebud thorn is kind of a fun way to um, frame it, but feel free to answer however. Kind of, what are you taking away from today's session? Um, you can share a rose, which is something new or exciting, a bud, like an emerging idea or a question you still have, um, or a thorn, something that challenges you or is making you feel uncomfortable or itchy. It's my favorite. Uh, sometimes I just feel itchy <laughs> about something. Um, so you can uh, feel free to unmute or raise your hand um, or put that in the chat if you want to share a rose, a bud, or a thorn, or any other sort of final takeaway that's on your mind. marinate. <laughs> I have one. I'm going to say a rose. Oh, maybe this is a bud or a thorn. I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe it's a thorn. We got to um, be less humble <laughs> in some cases because <laughs> there are a lot of leaders in this room. <laughs> Luckily, we talk to you in other spaces, so we know who you are. <laughs> but we don't always. I think as a bud, something that, um, I guess it's not really an emerging idea, but a continuous idea throughout the whole conversation has been opening up the channels of communication between different aspects of people and, and, and or different aspects of institutions versus growers and stuff like that. So I don't know if we can even find like a, a uh, group chat that we make or something like you know, as simple as that just to have like constant communication and resources because I know I'd be more than happy and I'm sure all of you would to put out all the resources that we possibly have for people upon you know being asked a question and maybe even making like a a document of of said facts like frequently asked questions about what we're doing I think that would be extremely helpful
nothing and he make me feel itchy. That could be a good sensation or not. I don't know. <laughs> Lindsay? Yeah. A couple of things if I could. Yeah, please. Uh, one is, one, it is a rose, uh, which it is the relationship, the child nutrition services staff and directors uh, have the relationship with the state, with the MDE, with Diane. I think she as, is a great person who represent child nutrition and uh, the help the student needs and the directors need to run the operation. Um, but uh, let's talk about you know ADCA and and the uh, and the um, House of Representatives, uh, the Congress, the Senate. I think it has to be a, a push to the to the USDA to help us for the things uh, we needed the most. And if you look at the grant, it is available. It is, like I said earlier, it is available for everything, but to develop our staff and the labor cost. Um, the, the, the third one, it is, uh, I'm uh, on the board for GLC. I'm a founding uh, member of GLC. And now uh, I wanna give a direction to any of my colleagues is to use your your money to the fullest and more. Because if you receive in $250,000, you could probably use 300, 300,000 because there's some people who are not using theirs. And sometimes additional grant coming in like the DOD, sometimes they get it. So stay with the consortium you are with to make sure if there is additional money is to make sure to grab it and every dollar helps. Um, and and especially small schools who who struggle sometimes, you know, larger schools, you know, sometimes we don't struggle. The the last one I want to say is about CEP. Man, reach out to the state, reach out to the state. Uh, luckily, I I got my school to be CEP before COVID in 2019, and we we'll, we are continue with it. It make our life a lot simpler and also drive us to do better for our kids because it is not entitlement. We want to give them to compete with the other with the other places. So because you go CEP, it does not mean that you have to lo lower the bar. You actually want to increase the bar. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and to me is these four things, I just want to share it with, with everybody and hopefully uh, we take it to heart. Break what it means. <laughs> it's like a step closer to universal meals, but not entirely there. Across the board. Thank you so much, Mom. They 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 don't charge for a bus, but they want to charge for lunch. No, yep, they don't charge for gym class. They don't charge for yeah. our class. <laughs> Poor kids. <laughs> yeah. As a bud, I'd also like to add that uh, if people want consultation with free kind of in-class uh, growing and agricultural, especially controlled ag um, information, that our company would be more than happy to provide resources and help out um, and even um, provide internship opportunities for people, especially in the city of Detroit. Hopefully I got all that. <laughs> oh, okay. Quite did. <laughs> and thanks, Jordan, for adding some of that stuff from the uh, chat. I think I think we can call it there because I think Colleen has a few things to close with. Um, so I think we're, we're a few minutes over our, our time. But I just want to say thank you all so much. This has been super helpful to, for us to better understand um, kind of what's going on with you all. And I, I feel like we've gotten a few really important policy priorities that you've brought up here, which is gonna help us, as Jordan said, with um, 
you know, some upcoming work we're going to do. And we'll reach out again, of course, um, around uh, looking at what, what the policy implications are for the Michigan New Food Charter and how can we all kind of work together um, to, to push for those changes or, or protect whatever we need to protect, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're happy to share more on that. I'll just kind of leave it with this slide here we, and we'll send this to you. But um, you know, you can come, you can go to uh, michiganfood.org and you can find all the same information and you can find our contact information. But um, you know, come come connect with us. We will have a, um, I'll put the link in the chat, but we'll have a, um, our Michigan Good Food Summit. Hopefully if you're on the myth and listserv, you got that notification this morning. Um, uh, in the fall, so we'll be looking for storytellers and facilitators, um, uh, and that will be a hybrid event. So we're really excited to continue to engage with you and I, I appreciate all of your insights. Turn it back to Colleen. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay and Jordan. And thank you to um, everyone for joining in on that conversation. Um, I think Part of what we wanted to get out of that was to help guide the farmed institution in some of our work and learning opportunities and networking opportunities, methods of communication for the coming years. So um, this was really helpful um, for me too. And we will use this in our planning for MIFIN activities this year. Thank you. So in the few moments that remain, I wanted to just review our calendar of events for the coming months, um, at least for 2023, because we've got a lot going on. First up is our deadline for nominations for the Miffin Advisory Committee, and I can drop that again into the chat, especially for those who might not have been around to join us earlier today. Um, there's the link for our call for nominations. Please do share that opportunity um, as well through your networks if it makes sense. And then on February 25th is the Michigan Family Farms Conference um, hosted by the Michigan Food and Farming Systems, MIFS, and that will be in Kalamazoo this year. A team from MDARD, MIFIN, and the Michigan Department of Education will be working together to bring a um, farm to school training for producers to that conference this year. We have three sessions that will line up as a bit of a farm to school track for those who are interested in learning more about selling to schools. And the last part of that, um, the last session will be more of what we're calling like a fireside chat or discussion. Um, so it will be more free form conversation um, around farm to school opportunities with producers um, and whatever they want to talk about. So keep that in mind if you're interested in networking, but also learning more about farm to school sales in particular. And then um, our Mariel Borgman with MSU Extension coordinated this opportunity. This is also farm to school training for producers. And it's a continuation of um, a training that we hosted in December at the Great Lakes Fruit Vegetable and Farm Market Expo over a day, but we didn't get to covering in depth all of the topics that we had hoped to cover. So uh, Mariel has coordinated uh, some follow-up sessions that can be virtual learning opportunities for farmers and producers that are interested in growing and planning to sell to schools. This is through the My Ag Ideas to Grow With virtual conference that's hosted by MSU Extension. And you'll see the dates and topics here. We have a variety of speakers um, that will be sharing about these training events um, or training topics. So join in for any and all that you're interested. And thanks, Mariel, for adding that to the chat. And then registration is now open for a series of Cultivate Michigan marketplaces that we will be hosting around <laughs> the state. So we just recently had a Cultivate Michigan marketplace in Kalamazoo, and we had one earlier in 2022 in Grand Rapids. So now we're working on covering most of the rest of the state. Uh, we've got 
events coming up in Detroit, Alpena, Ann Arbor, and Flint. And for those who might be unfamiliar, these marketplaces are regional networking events for institutional food buyers and farmers and food producers, um, especially those who have products that are right for institutional food service programs. Um, and we really dedicate this two hour space, all of these events are from four to 6 p.m. Um, for networking. So it's like a meet the buyers style event. We do have the buyers <laughs> stationed at tables around the room and the farmers and food suppliers kind of uh, navigating the space to meet the folks that they're interested in. The registration is live and we have, um, it's a, pretty substantial registration because we do provide some really cool materials at the event itself. Um, one is a passport and another is kind of a supply and demand um, spreadsheet that will chart that will help you navigate the event that you choose to come to. So if you're interested in one or more of these events, we have a unified registration link for all of them and you can choose one or more events as you would like to and just register, register once. Um, and thanks, Lindsay, for the endorsement. I'm sure she would like to just attend some of these um, <laughs> because they're pretty fun also. So um, if you're interested in making more connections, and I heard that as a um, need today, then these are some of some spaces that we're helping to make for that conversation to happen between institutional food service buyers and farmers and food suppliers of local and regional foods. And you'll see we've got our partners um, who are co-hosting these events with us named here, and we thank them for their partnership because we certainly can't do it without them. Um, these events are regional in nature, so we need those local partners to really make them be what they should be. So appreciate that partnership. And I put the... Um, link to more information, including the registration link in the chat there, if you're interested. So it's gonna be a busy couple months for us. And um, we've got just a couple more minutes. I can hold the time if anybody has any other announcements for the good of the group, whether you wanna chat them in or mention them um, to the group, please feel free. Any other events, resources? things of note that you would like everyone to know about. I did add the link to making it in Michigan, which includes a trade show. Um, that'll be on April 20th. And there's a trade show and workshops and like, um, I think like a small business pitch kind of a thing that's re related to the Michigan Good Food Fund. Um, so there's, there's some cool things happening with that. Where is that this year? That's actually going to be at the Lansing Center, so it will be in Lansing, and it is a partnership between um, MSU Extension, the Product Center, and um, as well as um, MDARD and uh, the, um, I was getting it wrong, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So this that takes the place of what used to be the like Pure Michigan or Michigan Ag Summit, um, and it, making it in Michigan also existed in parallel with that. So they've combined forces. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Any other notes for the good of the group? All right. Hearing none for now. We can wrap up just a few minutes early. Um, is there another one? Am I missing something? Thank you. I was just saying, if, if you guys wanted me to start a channel of communication, I'd be happy to head that up. Just let me know. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to talk more about that. And luckily, our um, Miffin management team is having the second part of our annual retreat tomorrow. So we will have this information um, to digest more and follow up on um, for that conversation tomorrow. Well, it was nice to see some familiar faces and some and some new ones. Indeed. Appreciate the conversation today. Thank you so much.
and we will have more to come. Um, so definitely stay tuned and we'll keep you posted as we go. And for those who are out and about, stay safe in the snow today. And those who aren't, just stay warm and enjoy it, hopefully. Um, so we'll be in touch as we've got more coming this year. And really appreciate your participation and good thoughts today. And we'll see you next time. See you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank Thank you. So you twice today. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.